And so we have Pei Zhang uh, from CERN, who is going to be telling us about the influence of cooldown conditions at TC on the queue of Niobium sputter quarter wave regulators. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Welcome back. So, um, as Jan said, uh, I'll talk about how we cool down the cavity, the influence of uh, how you cool down the cavity. After all these talks, how you can improve the film, how you improve the quality factor, but if you're not careful enough, when you cool down the cavity, you still lose some of the performance. That's basically this another contribution how to make a cavity works even better. So this, after the brief introduction of the Isola and the QWI, you heard the talk yesterday from Alba, and I will talk to you the impact of the thermal gradient and the cool down speed. That's basically the two factors when you cool down the cavity. And then it's the impact of the ambient magnetic field. We know that for back now, when you shield your cavity or for this now being coated cavity, especially for our quarter wave resonator, we don't, sh we don't do the shielding. I will show you how sensitive this uh, to the uh, ambient magnetic field when you cool down the cavity. And then I will just briefly mention two little topics here. One is the frequency shift during the transition. We know when you, when you cool down the cavity, the frequency changes because of the mind may affect the expulsion of magnetic field. I'll show you how this uh, related to the performance of our cavity. And then finally, I'll show you some of the uh, latest results we just did last month for the helium processing on the low bit of cavity, and you'll see the impact on low, low field Q9. Okay, just to uh, refresh your memory, so the cavity we're working on is uh, it's, it's a real cavity, it's going to be put into the NAC for, for a project which is high zoda. And the, the technology we're using here is now being spotted on copper, and it's quarter wave resonator. And the cavity uh, shape is pretty standard. It's, uh, you have the E field focus here on, on the tip of the antenna and the uh, H field on top of the cavity. And our cavity is a hundred megahertz, uh, working at 4.5 Kelvin. And we're target at 10 watts, uh, maximum dissipation power at 6 micrometer. And then as Alan showed yesterday already, we're in production. So this is this is by no means it's just a pure, a pure R&D project. It's really uh, the things we are doing during the production of the cavity, and we have to deliver five cavities by the end of the year. So we're really uh, stressed, and uh, you will see that we are limit, limited. We can't really do whatever things we want because we have a very tight schedule to, to keep. So after the coating, after the frequency tuning of the cavity, and the cavity will be coated. Anyway, so uh, coated back here, and then uh, put it into the coat test. The whole process takes about four weeks. If everything works out, we'll store the cavity. If not, we'll have to do a strip the analogy and do another coating. Uh, before that, so the frequency might shift, and then there, that's another topic. So, um, just give you some statistics. So, the data I'm going to show you today is basically from, Jan from February this year to June this year, and for five cavities. And you see some of the cal most of the cavities see uh, two times initial cool down, that means they're cooling from 300k down to 4.5. And um, see us, uh, a few, some of the cavities will see a multiple of five, even you know, five times the thermal cycling. That means uh, you work, when you cool down the cavity at 4.5, then you warm up the cavity slightly to 15 or 20k, just about the transition, you cool down again. So we'll see the effect. So uh, just starting from, uh, okay, uh, from this slide onwards, uh, you won't bother about the, all the naming of the cavities, I won't distinguish any cavity thing, I'll put everything together, just give you a statistic. So you see this is basically um, five cavities from different cooldown. And uh, you see this, uh, the cube, you have some different effects. I put everything here. You see some of the cavities that field emission will correct it, will make it work in the end. Some of the cavities don't have a nice, uh, they have some slope. But in general, this is the performance of the cavity after the initial cooldown from 300 degree, uh, 300K. And if you do a thermal cycling, as you can see, most of the cavity goes up. You see a performance in here. A low field, basically a low field right here. I put some multi packing here, and uh, it's not my put multi packing while we do this, so we see multi packing and also field emission here. Just to show you that this is, this is different physics, it doesn't matter if you need a very good cavity, it's really the enhancement is coming from the low field part. It's not, it doesn't matter whether you have field emission or whatever things. And this summer cycle won't help you for the field emission because field emission is coming from different physics. Okay, so uh, since we see the performance, I'll just give you some numbers. I'll um, how much we can gain by doing some cycling from different cavities. So this is the pair of the initial cooldown and the uh, the cycling. This is the low field RS. Low field, what I define here, is 0.2 micrometer. For us, it's uh, 0.2 times. So it's uh, basically um, uh, two millitesla. So it's two millitesla maximum B field. So um, as you can see here, 
the best we can get is the gain of the performance at low fuel power by 55%, and the lowest we can get is the 12%. So it's basically worse to do some study on this to see why we, uh, we gain, uh, which kind of the factor can affect this, the, the performance gain. The first thing we notice is the, uh, our cavity, the cooling scheme for our cavity is uh, conduction cooling. So you put liquid helium basically in the center of the uh, inner conductor, and then uh, the outer conductor is conduction cooled by the, uh, the, the liquid helium. And we have two temperature sensors uh, on top of the cavity and uh, the bottom of the cavity. And if you look at these sensors during the cool down, you see this, uh, they have a temperature differences. So our cavity constantly, because of the conduction cooling, the bottom of the cavity is always warmer than the top of the cavity, which is closer to the liquid helium. And you can see that during the transition, you see this, um, this, uh, this is thermal differences. What I define the thermal gradient here is uh, within this uh, plus minus 1K, so our transition temperature is 9.5K, and the plus minus 1K within this range, I calculate the average delta T, and this is what I define as the thermal gradient. And if you look at the thermal gradient during the um, initial cool down, it's basically uh, systematically higher, the gradient is higher than the thermal cycling, which is understandable because you cool down the cavity from 300K and, um, and the thermal cycling is only warm up to 20K. And you see some uh, fluctuations of the thermal gradients during the thermal cycle of this red dot here. And uh, this is basically contributed, uh, attributed to the uh, how high you cool down, you, you warm up your cavity too. Because that most of the cases we warm the cavity from 10 to 20, so basically 15k or 20k. But there are several cases we warm up to a little bit higher for different reasons. So um, a second thing, you notice that uh, is the how fast you cool down. It's not just the thermal gradient; it's also how fast you cool down the cavity. Um, this is from the initial cool down from uh, 11. 11K to 8.5K, I mean, our transition temperature is 9.5K. As you can see, it takes about 100 seconds or 500 seconds, it varies a bit, to, uh, to cool the cavity from 11K to 8.5K for the initial cool down from 300K. And this is the uh, solo cycle. During the solo cycle, you see it's much faster because you warm up to 20K only and then cool down from there. And you see that basically it's 10 times or 20 times faster during the thermal cycling. And uh, the way I define this cooldown speed, again, we don't trust just one point at 9.5 because so a large cavity of cavity is about one meter high. So again, we use a range from uh, plus minus 1K within the, to, the, uh, to the transition temperature. And within this speed, within this time, I count how much time it need to cool the cavity from 10.5 to 8.5 and then use this as a speed, to calculate as a speed. So if you can. If you look at here at the bottom there, the blue one, the blue dot is the uh, initial cooldown from 300K. As you can see, the cooldown speed is quite slow because you have to cool 150 kilogram of copper down to uh, down to 4.5K. Even the transition here is, uh, is only 2K, but it needs a long time there. But for the thermal side point, since we only warm up to a 20K, so it takes much faster time. And also you see a spread over there which is not our intention at the beginning, but in the end we have the nice spread and this give us the statistics to study that. So basically now we have two trends of, uh, of, uh, of cool down and the initial uh, of the summer cycle. Basically the summer cycling and the spread, you have relatively similar summer gradients, but you have a spread of cool down speed. For the, uh, for, for the blue one, which is initial cool down, you see basically the speed is relatively the same, but the uh, summer gradients, they, have, they vary. So the first thing, if you compare the surface resistance at low field, again, at 0 0.2 megawatt per meter, basically the uh, 2 milli tesla um, peak magnetic field. At this, if you look at, if you plot this uh, surface resistance versus this uh, cooldown speed, you see basically, if you look at the red point there, it basically shows no uh, dependence, at least it's not so clear. But you see a clear dependent uh, spread of the blue, which is basically have the same cooldown speed, but the spread out of the surface resistance, which is uh, coming from the gradient. So this is the, the vertical you see is again surface resistance. The horizontal is the thermal gradient. You see it have a nice dependence on how during the cooldown what is the temperature differences of your cavity. And this is uh, coming from this uh, some current trapped, and then um, when you do a thermal gradient, you have a small break, the thermal cycle has a small gradient to release the trap, so actually you generate less losses. So it's very obvious in, the, in, uh, in our cavity now. Um, if you look even further, because the things what I show here is the low feed surface resistance. 
And uh, there are certain cases, as you can see from here, you not just only gain the, uh, the residual or the low field part, you also gain a slope. You see the slope improved slightly as well. So there's another. So we basically look a little bit uh, closer to this. There's no model again, so um, it's just uh, we we'll just try to fit the because to us it looks like a linear. Just we we'll try just try to fit a linear part and all the exponential part we just forget about that. Just a linear part to, to extract the residual resistance and also the linear slope up to or for us is up to three megawatt per meter basically again three times ten thirty uh, thirty minute Tesla. Again, look at the cooldown speed of the residual and the uh, and the slope. Linear slope basically it shows uh, similar dependence. So basically, there's no dependence, basically. no obvious dependence for us. If you look at the gradient, not just the low field uh, surface resistance, but also both the uh, residual and also the slope shows a clear dependence on the thermal gradient. So basically, that's depend. This tells you that when you cool down a cavity, if you have a small gradient, a thermal gradient, you get a better performance. Uh, okay, if so I jump to another topic, which is the ambient magnetic field shielding for this cavity. So basically, as I said, our cavity has no shielding. So that means that when you do the cool down, the cavity is immersed in the Earth's magnetic field. In our case, we're married in our crowd set in that cavern. It's about 62 megatesla. And we have some coils around this, uh, around this inside the crowd set. But unfortunately, we can't move it, we can't rotate it. So we have. We cannot, we cannot completely compensate all the uh, magnetic fields. We have some residual of 18 microtesla. Mic so basically reduced by 70% from the ambient, and uh, if you change the polarity, they enhance it, so it's, uh, it's 85%. So in this case, we've got three points. We can study how sensitive our cavity to the, uh, to the magnetic field during the cooldown. So this is what it is. So basically it looks quite, sim uh, quite linear, and the sensitivity of the structure here for two different cavities, uh, they are Basically, about 0.03 or 0.04 now on per microtesla, thanks to Sarah. Uh, this is the number I got for the bulk melvin. For 1.3 gigahertz, cavity is basically 3.5 nano ohm per microtesla, and at a scale to 100 megahertz, it's about 1 nano ohm per microtesla. So, as you can see, for the coated cavity, we always say that the coated cavity they are very, is not so sensitive to the magnetic field, I mean magnetic field. So, this is, the, this is kind of the proof. And I list the table here for you. It's just to show for our high solar cavity, if we completely shield the uh, ambient magnetic field during the cool down, how much we will gain in the cavity performance. And you can see from here, it's about 10%. And again, if we enhance it, that's a number uh, I'm putting here 120, because our cavity, we have a solenoid in between the cavity. If you do a solenoid cycling, and you have remnant field over there, the remnant field, the mirror is about 0.5. About 50 uh, microtesla, and if you're on top of the, uh, if you line up with your ambient magnetic field, then they enhance it to 120. So that's what we will lose, basically about 10 percent as well. But the remnant field, you can always do a de, a de gaussing to get rid of it. So that's um, that's why we decide not to do any uh, composition uh, or magnetic field shielding for the cryo module for the high zone cavity. Again, the third topic is uh, it's just one slide. Show the frequency shift during the transition, which is uh, we know because uh, during the um, our transition temperature is about 9.5. Okay, here, and as you warm up the cavity, and you see the frequency shifted up very quickly. And if you look at the how much the uh, frequency shift from the uh, from the superconducting phase to the non-conducting phase, and look back on the Q naught, the low field Q naught of the cavity, you see a nice dependence. Of this, uh, they're basically telling you that whether you have a good cavity, a large shift, a bad cavity, a small shift, which is also understandable because you have, once you have a good cavity, that means uh, during the transition after the superconducting case, you expose everything, the, the magnetic field. So your uh, expulsion is basically telling you how, how, how good your cavity expels the, uh, the magnetic field. So this is the, this is by no means I want to show any models, it's just guide your eyes to the flame there. Uh, the last topic is on the field emission, because uh, for this cavity, from some time, we see field emission. And this is the typical case, where we see field emission is basically uh, happening here, because we have a high electric field region there. We have uh, electron emit from the tip, and it will just be accelerated. The peak magnetic field, uh, electric field is here, and the bombard is the plate. 
And a few cases while we disassemble the cavity, we see burn marks on the cavity plate. So it's really a they'll come bombard the surface. And you see during the field emission, you see the, the, the temperature on the bottom plate grows up quite quickly. And also the radiation level goes up quite quickly after the helium processing, which is from the blue to the red to the right triangle, you see you crack to this uh, high field field emission and then by doing one solar cycle you get the gain and the residual and also you, uh, you crack to the linear slope slightly. That's the, uh, that's the normal case. Just in the last months we tested another cavity uh, which you can see from here. The cavity has field emission at the beginning. But after the helium processing you see the degeneration quite largely for the low field QNAT. And it's about 45% uh, on the low field q And this cannot be recovered by a normal uh, solar cycle, which is only to uh, 13K. And if you want to correct it, that's what we did. If you warm up instead of to uh, 13K, warm up to uh, 60K. In this case, you can recover the Q, the low field q naught goes here. And then uh, by doing another normal solar cycle, you crack the, uh, the slope from the grain to the magenta as well. So basically, that's what our suspicion is. Uh, once you do helium processing of this cavity, you have some gas stuff attached on the surface. You really have to warm up a, lo a little bit higher to release this and to get rid of it. So then we do a few more helium processing just to confirm that it's not some uh, something which is uh, which has happened uh, some some random effect. So basically, we do uh, two more helium processing on the same cavity. We didn't warm it up uh, one, once actually. Um, you see the same effect for the second helium processing, also the third one. The third one is more dramatic, so we warm up the cavity completely to 260, but without opening the chamber, and then cool down again, just to see whether we can further release all the things, but it seems not. 60K or 50K is enough for this cavity. And our explanation for this kind of effect is that instead of having field emission on tip, this cavity might have the field emission on top of the cavity, or close to the top, where you have a strong magnetic field. When you use the helium processing, Basically, the helium bombard your surface, and you, this, uh, the temperature rise up very quickly, and then you've got some non-conducting part, and the, because of the high magnetic field there, you trap the magnetic field, and then this, they release. Then you see this really the degeneration of the low field, low field part. Because as you can see, this cavity, uh, we can push to because um, our nominal is a six megawatt meter, we can push to eight or nine, without increasing the temperature or the of the radiation that much because the electric field on top of the cavity is quite low, so you really have to push to very high field to really make this, uh, the, the, the uh, helium can process this part and the electron can, can be emitted. Um, okay, to summarize, um, there are several, effect, uh, several factors can affect your q uh, The first thing is where this from the thermal gradient, and we see a very dependence in our QWR, coated, now being coated cavity, um, the larger the thermal gradient to during the cool down during the transition, the, the worse the performance. And the second effect we'll look at is the cool down speed. It seems like in our case it's not so sensitive. Uh, well, our variation with the cool down speed is about this, from uh, 10 to uh, 200, so it's 20 times. So it's the, uh, the speed variation, but we didn't see a clear hands on that. And then the third one we look at is the ambient magnetic field during the cool down for this cavity. It seems not, not so sensitive, and that's the uh, that's why we go for no compensation or no shooting on the main issue for the crash step. All right, thank you. Okay, questions? How do you do the thermal cycle exactly? How, how do you, what do you do to cycle? We stop the valve. That means there's no helium goes into the cavity. Then we warm up the cavity if you want to accelerate. That's how we do it. Turn on the RF, we want to boil out all the helium inside the inner conductor because we are not bass crude, it's relatively fast. And after that, we let the cavity warm up, but we'll keep the cavity in the cold box. So the cavity is uh, the thermal screen and the, and the window is still cold. So the cavity warm up to a 15K, then we start the helium again, and the cavity cool down. So that's how we do it. But you don't have a thermometer on the inner conductor. So we do have one. We do have one, but it's, uh, it's in the bath. Yeah, we do have. Yeah, we have. So what do you want to see from that? You want to see the differences of the inner conductor and outer conductor temperature. No, so my impression is that you don't really master the movement of gas from a colder part to a warmer, uh, sorry, from a warmer to a colder one 
what you do thermal cycling or medium processing. Because actually you don't evacuate very well from that cabin. You can you can dissolve gas, but you don't get it out or or not so well because the conductance is just hydraulic conductance, it's just through the two beam holes. Yeah, it means you totally. can move move gas around without evacuating it and just transporting it from a warmer to a colder surface. I know that's and true. The coolest is, is where the, where the feed will then be maximum. Because if you look at our cavity here. You see the helium is in this phase, it's not RF phase. The RF phase will have no chance to see any helium. It's not contact. So the helium is inside, really inside here. And this is the RF volume. And we have beam, beam port shutter to close the beam port. So basically, I don't know whether the beam port shutter is... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's not vacuum type. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Can I? <coughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's maybe related to, to this question in a sense, but... Uh, uh, you, uh, with your your uh, thermal gradient results, basically um, claiming uh, what uh, Julia Vogt uh, had uh, discussed, uh, which is that uh, there's a, a thermal current yeah. induced by the thermal gradient yeah. that then uh, causes uh, a magnetic flux that is that is trapped in the. Uh, That's what we believe. At the beginning, we thought there we only have thermal. Well, some gradient, or we already have some current because we don't have a loop. But I'm not sure that it's right because we have a we have a bottom plate which I'm not showing here, and we have a rod connected to the bottom plate. The plate is a tuning plate, and we have a rod connected to the top, the top, of, top of the uh, this crane. Maybe this crane is blue because the top crane is like uh, 50k or 60k, and uh, top of the cabin is quite cold. The bottom is warm, and the warm on the other side as well. So uh, in this case, I'm sure it, uh, But it's, it's the contact points between the dissimilar metals that would play a role in that point. Yeah, in that case, right. right? The temperature. It actually doesn't matter what the no. gradient within the cavity is, it's uh, what the contact... The temperatures of the, <coughs> the bimetallic uh, yeah, contact. Yeah, right. I mean, let me, let me play devil's advocate and ask you... I mean, uh, Yuya has gone to tons of measurements and, and seen exactly this, this effect. And, uh, yeah. and uh, we've uh, pretty much ruled out that it's gases that are responsible for this. Because you can go up, you can go down, with, depending on how you adjust the, the gradient. But let me ask, I mean, do our measurements show with the uh, external magnetic field what your sensitivity is? And that it's very small, 0.035 nano ohms per yeah. micro tesla. Yeah. Uh, your thermal gradients are not so, I mean, they're, they're pretty small too compared to at least what, what uh, Yuya used in her measurements. Yeah. Um, how, I mean, even if you get a strong magnetic field due to thermal currents, how do you explain this quite significant change in Q since your cavity is very insensitive to trapped flux?
So we have the final talk uh, for today, which is uh, also coming from CERN. Zara uh, Awad is at CERN and the uh, University of Siegen. And um, uh, she's also been looking into